Disease can be an ever-present danger in the world. It can have such a massive impact that some undertake special training just to resist it, especially those who practice the stoic traditions of monkhood or the grandiose oaths of the paladin. So why are sickness and disease underused in D&D? Simply put, the mechanics for them suck and in fact are mostly non-existent and rarely get used. But disease can be an amazing element to feature in your games. It can be a hazard for characters to overcome in an adventure. It can be a core component of the setting with the threat of a particular disease constantly looming over the world or even be the basis of a campaign. Regardless of how you use disease, it adds an element of danger that can't be gained in any other way. That of an unseen terror that slowly but efficiently infects and kills. Fast moving lethal diseases might elicit fears of divine retribution, while slower moving persistent diseases might warp and entire culture. Entire factions might even be dedicated to stopping a particularly significant disease or helping it spread. You see, sickness and disease are cool. They can make for an awesome game, adding an element that is rarely featured in D&D. However, there are also some pitfalls to using disease. So today we're gonna be looking at five mistakes to avoid when implementing disease at your game and what to do instead. In essence, we're going to be walking through how to use diseases and illnesses and infections better in your game. Also, to save you the trouble of taking notes, fleshing out specific rules, and creating your own tables, our new disease system, Infection and Illness, a treatise on disease, is available in the July 2022 issue of Layer Magazine, which all DM Layer patrons get. Number one, not having disease worsen over time. Many times in D&D, if someone gets sick, they have specific mechanical disadvantages that are static. That, that is, they don't change. They don't get worse. They just are. However, a key hallmark of disease is that it worsens over time. This worsening is typically combated by the infected person's immune system, medicine, magic, and other means, but it is always a threat. So you should have different stages for your diseases. Something happens when the person is infected, and then the disease progresses, getting worse and worse. In our new disease system, for instance, if someone is exposed to the disease prickling fur, upon initial infection, the person progresses to stage one of the disease. And then, because prickling fur is a mild disease, we'll talk more about disease severities a little bit later, every week there is a chance that the disease will progress to the next stage. And of course, each stage of the disease gets progressively worse and has increasing disadvantages. These disadvantages are often mechanical, that is, they affect the character's ability to function well in the game, but they don't have to be strictly mechanical. As a quick note too, remember that you don't have to use disease only with player characters. Consider using disease as a backdrop to adventures and campaigns where mostly ordinary people are the afflicted. Characters may or may not become infected because that's not the point. Instead, the point is that you are running an adventure or campaign that features disease as a driving plot point. Finally, if a disease progresses too far, it should become life-threatening, except in the case of the most minor illnesses. Number two, not having disease spread. This is something else we often ignore. Someone gets sick and it often ends there. However, another hallmark of disease is that it spreads. Sometimes the spread of disease often runs unabated for long periods often forever in the cases of naturally occurring diseases present in a particular region. So you should have some mechanic built in that addresses how diseases spread. In our new disease system, for instance, we've broken diseases up by their transmission types, airborne, insectborne, waterborne, and direct contact. And then the route of transmission determines the rate of random spread, with airborne having the greatest chance of infecting others and direct contact the least. Now, there's a chance that your characters will scoff at becoming infected with some disease because they are just too minor and they have crazy godlike powers. However, remember that PCs are not the only people in the game world. What happens if the characters are nonchalant about the infirmities they carry because the mechanical drawbacks just aren't that bad? But as they jaunt across the game world, they are spreading those diseases to the general populace. A minor disease for a PC could be something dire for a commoner. So don't forget to consider that sort of thing and build in complications and consequences in your games that account for this. Fun fact, I was recently in a game run by my team member, Zach, you may know them as Goliath Cleric, and I was playing a monk named Barbaric who was immune to disease. But that did not stop Zach from having some of the populace in a large city become infected 
infected by my monk, who, though he was immune, was still a carrier of the pathogen. Of course, my monk Barbaric didn't care that other people got infected from him, <laughs> which, which led to consequences down the road. He may have been totally forsaken by his lawful good deity and, uh, forced to follow a dark, dark path instead. By the way, when you become a DM Layer patron and get Layer Magazine, our new disease system isn't the only thing you'd be getting. We pack tons of Dungeon Master resources into every monthly issue of the Layer Magazine. Each issue has two to three complete, fully fleshed out DB 5th edition adventures that include digital maps for online play. You also get other DM resources such as new monsters, magic items, traps, and puzzles. Not only can Layer Magazine help reduce your prep time and make your game even more awesome, but it might even inspire you to new levels of creativity and get your game out of that rut that it might be in. You can become a DLR patron at the link below. Remember, my goal is to help you both through the free resources we publish, such as this video and others, and through our premium resources, such as Layer Magazine. Number three, not having varying disease severities. Many times in D&D, a disease is a disease is a disease. But that's not true in the real world. Some things are minor, other things things are really, really bad. For instance, we recently had a pandemic that shut down most of the world. However, not every sickness and infirmity is that bad. Instead, there should be a variety of disease severities in your game. Mild diseases are by definition benign. They're, they're common, easily treated with proper knowledge, and have relatively mild symptoms that don't typically threaten someone's life. Often they will go away on their own without treatment, though it can be an unpleasant experience getting to that point. On the other hand, life-threatening diseases are the most serious diseases that one can encounter. Without immediate treatment, the average person will likely die soon after showing their first symptoms. Resilient people, such as PCs, can withstand it for a while, but will suffer extreme debilitation while doing so. For instance, in our new disease system, we've broken down diseases into three severities, mild, moderate, and life-threatening. And of course, the mechanical effects of the different severities are different, ranging from mild to really, really bad. Imagine that. Also, the progression varies by severity. Mild and moderate diseases check for progression to the next stage once a week. However, life-threatening diseases require a daily check and there are not multiple stages. Instead, they have a single stage and progress towards death instead of worsening symptoms. Remember that mild disease might be fairly common in your game world, moderate diseases less common, and life-threatening diseases quite rare. And why is that? Well, because folk with mild and moderate diseases survive long enough to pass them on. However, people with severe diseases often die very quickly, perhaps before they can infect others. But also, the high mortality rate sparks fear and panic in the general populace. They will take extreme measure to quarantine the sick and sanitize, often by fire, because that's what we do in D&D, right? We burn everything, burn everything to the ground. Anything they think might be infected, such as homes and personal belongings. And again, we're talking about the context of a medieval fantasy world here, not modern times. It's just a little bit different. It, yeah, and lies outside the context of this video. <laughs> By the way, if you're enjoying this video and plan to infect your players' precious characters with some horrible affliction in your next game session, please give me a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let me know all the horrible ways you plan to make your players squeal in agony. Which reminds me, bacon. Don't, don't ask me why, it, it just does. Number four, making treatment too easy. In D&D 5th edition, lesser restoration is the fix all, the cure of everything, the healer of all disease. And almost every group by the time they reach level three is going to have at least one character that can cast lesser restoration. And if you roll with this and allow lesser restoration to cure any and all diseases, it will render all diseases inconsequential for the characters. One quick little spell and boop, you're healed. Now, lesser restoration is hardly the only spell that can treat disease and sickness, but it is a suitable benchmark to gauge the effectiveness of other spells. My suggestion is to make treatment treating and curing diseases more challenging. Otherwise, you're spending lots of game prep time to integrate diseases more only to have them be trivial and meaningless. Something your players might just ignore because it is easily overcome and cured. For instance, in our new disease system, I know I'm talking a lot about it today, but we, we thought about all of these things. The effectiveness of lesser restoration is determined by the severity of the disease. Lesser restoration will cure most mild diseases that have not progressed to their life 
life-threatening stage. When lesser restoration is cast on someone infected with a moderate disease, it will relieve the infected person's symptoms for 24 hours and provide a better chance for recovery after treatment is applied. And finally, lesser restoration is unable to treat life-threatening disease unless otherwise specified. Also, don't let magic be the only way to treat diseases. There should be other mundane cures available for people or the PCs to pursue. For instance, with gut infestation, the consumption of a paste made from rock flowering nettle alleviates symptoms. Who would have guessed? Gonna go out and get myself some rock flowering nettle tomorrow. Now, this plant is difficult to find, only growing in forest clearings away from the pollution of large cities. So that could be the backdrop and driving force for an adventure that your players might go on, either to heal themselves or a group of NPCs requesting their help. I do want to note here too, that when you use disease in your game, you don't always have to challenge your players' characters with them. Th that is, the PCs might not be the ones getting sick. They are the heroes in the game and incredibly powerful so it might not make sense that they are the infected, th though they certainly could be, of course. Instead, consider using disease and infirmity as a driving force for some of the adventures your player's characters might go on. Number five, ignoring disease after death. With one of my gaming groups, it is an ongoing joke that death heals all. In other words, whatever affliction you might have, exhaustion, poisoned, reduced maximum hit points, disease, etc. If the group doesn't have healing magic to fix it, they could just let the character die and then use Revivify. Because you know, for some reason, that would completely heal them from whatever ailment they had. And this, of course, is a myth that is floating around out there, a myth that is completely false. In the case of a disease, someone who dies while infected should have a more difficult time coming back from death and likely still be afflicted with the disease if they do return. In our new disease system, if an individual dies while infected with a disease, the disease does not instantly disappear. For the first 2d10 days after death, the body continues to be a vector for continued infection, with the disease continuing to spread from the body the same way it did while alive. Now, in the case of magic that raises a person from the dead, for spells that do not state they cure disease after being cast, the character returns in the same stage with the same affliction as when they died. Now, as a mild concession, any permanent death saving throws that were failed are reset, providing a fresh, albeit difficult, chance at recovery. Permanent failed death saving throws are part of our disease system that we've fleshed out. I kind of haven't talked about it before, but it's part of the system, so go get the system and it'll make sense. <laughs> However, even if the spell does cure the disease, there is a chance the character might be reinfected along with the spellcaster who must cast the spell because they have to do so in close proximity to the diseased character. And why is this? Well, because that disease might have been cured from their body when the spell was cast, but it might still infect their clothing and personal effects. And it might have spread to the caster while they're casting the spell to raise them from the dead. Don't forget, if you're watching this video in July or August, you can instantly get access to the July 2022 issue of Layer Magazine, which contains our new disease system by becoming a DM Layer patron at the link below. And if you're watching this video a bit later, you can pick up back issues of Layer Magazine on the DM Layer store, also linked below. Click on the screen now to become a DM Layer patron, get an issue of Layer Magazine every month, and play D&D with me, or to learn how to implement animal companions in your games. And until next time, infect your players with the hideous disease of bacon! Wait, wait, no. Ba bacon is good.